So welcome everyone. I can't believe it's already March 1st. It's crazy. Um, but it is taking us into Empowerment and Confidence Month, which we're so excited to have you, Roberta, here to talk about emotional intelligence and a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. Um, we have some questions lined up that she's kind of helped me get to and that she wants to answer. Um, so we'll learn. And then we also have some exercises that she's going to take us through. Um, and I think we forgot the index cards, but we'll have to grab those and bring them in for us. Too. Oh, yeah. And I've got, I've got some of mine as examples. Perfect. Awesome. Good. Now, well, physical exercise. Right? Yeah. <laughs> nothing physical. No, nothing yeah. physical. It's, it's only as physical as writing. There you go. With right. your hands. Yeah. You can do that. So get your hands yeah. ready. <laughs> I, I wanted you guys to have index cards to leave with and maybe somebody to practice. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. This is Roberta Moore. Hi. Yes. Um, we're so happy to have you here today. Thank you again for coming. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and kind of how you got to where you are today. Thank you. I always love answering that question. <laughs> and I'm going to be honest and transparent because it's going to, I'm hopefully it's going to help you with the exercise and empowerment and confidence. So I I started my career out in accounting, if you can believe that or not. Yeah. It was because my father was the CFO of a privately held company. And when I was little, he didn't know he didn't very often work on Saturdays, but every now and then he'd have to go in on a Saturday and he would take me with him. And I loved going into the office with him. And the people who worked with him used to call me daddy's little accountant. Aww. Which was cute, and I really was a daddy's girl. I really admired my father, and yet, this is an important part of the story, I think I was nine, somewhere between nine and 12, and my father said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a psychologist, or I want to be a model. <laughs> I was a kid, and my father said, I'm sure he was trying to help me, but in my young girl's brain, I didn't, I misread it maybe, he said, well, you may never get married. You may never have a husband. In that, it, yeah, I know, right? It's so you awesome. better go get a degree where you can make money and support yourself. And he did not think psychology would be one where you could make money. And so I don't know if that's why I ended up in accounting. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't such a great fit because it, did, it never came naturally to me. It never felt like something I could do easily with my eyes closed. It felt like a lot of effort, even though I did pass the CPA exam. And when I was in accounting, I went from internal audit uh, for my first job, where I, where I traveled internationally because I spent a school year living in France, and I, at the time, spoke French really well. Now, not so much. But that part was fun. But then when I transitioned into public accounting, and I got a Masters of Science in Taxation, because I thought if I kept learning, and I'll tell you the truth, I felt like I wasn't smart enough, and that I had to keep getting more and more education in order to stand out and maybe get promoted. So I just kept studying, but I still didn't like my job. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make, that I wondered why wasn't I feeling satisfied? Why didn't I feel fulfilled? And then, and this was years ago, long before they had dedicated people in CPA firms to doing business development. Like they didn't have a Donna Herbs back then. You couldn't, you couldn't be like that. So I wanted to do business development because I realized I liked interacting with people way more than I did doing tax returns. Although I like putting puzzles together. So that was somewhat fun. So I talked them into letting me network letting me meet people. And back in those days, it was harder because it wasn't like this. <laughs> and they said, well, you have to be chargeable, fully chargeable if you're going to do that. Sounds like you understand. <laughs> so I attempted to do both and I was successful at it, but I had to prove that every client that I helped bring into the firm had to make like a spreadsheet saying, here's when I met with them. Here's how many times I met with them. Here's what partner, because I wasn't a partner. And they used to think, only partners could do this kind of stuff. So it was just too much effort. It, it, it was a whole lot of effort. And when I got married and we left St. Louis, because my husband had a better job offer somewhere else, 
I looked around and there were, this is Columbia, South Carolina. It's very different now. But back in the day, we found two other female CPAs. There were no women's networking groups back in those days. And I just thought, I didn't want to be one of, <laughs> one, I didn't want to be the third female okay. CPA. <laughs> So my husband said, you always talk about psychology. You always talk about um, how wonderful therapy is. Because, oh, by the way, when I was unhappy in my job, uh, and I wasn't doing, this is before I met my husband, I wasn't doing so great in my relationships with men, you know, dating relationships. A girlfriend said to me, Roberta, I think you'd benefit from going to my therapist. And I did. I went and I did. And I'm sure that's how I met my husband. Uh, because I had to change how I chose people to date. So that's why I had this love of therapy and love of psychology because it helped me so much. It helped me change my confidence. It helped me change my assertiveness. So I went and got the degree in that and then I got the license. And then, because I felt old by this point, <laughs> I started my own business or they call it a practice. I started that right away. And that was when I was in North Carolina. And then what I found out is people who would come in, like professionals, bankers, lawyers, CPAs, people like that, they find me saying, I need help for my, um, I need help with my spouse. I need help with my daughter. And, and I'll just use this example because it sticks in my mind forever of someone who was high, a high level in a bank and his daughter was eight and she had a math test where she didn't get a hundred and she was used to getting a hundred in school. And this, I think it happened more than one time. She told her parents she was going to kill herself because she didn't get a hundred in school. And at the time I did play therapy a lot with children. And upon working with this young girl, I found out that all she really wanted was more time with her dad and her dad I'm sure he thought he was doing his job providing for the family because the mother didn't work. But I had to try to explain that to him. And then, and then when I um, delved in further, I found out he also had trouble communicating at work. And that's what was a hot, that was an aha moment for me because I thought, I remember how I was unhappy and, and not, I didn't always feel like I had a voice in my struggles to do business development and things like that, that I wanted to do. And I thought there's gotta be a lot more people like that out there. And I miss my business brain. So how could I bring psychology into the workplace without there being any kind of HIPAA compliance <laughs> violations yeah. or, or stigma? Because there's sometimes a stigma in therapy. And I had remembered that my therapist who had been here at the time, told me about Daniel Goleman's book when it first came out. It was called Emotional Intelligence at Work or something like that. And that that meant a lot to her and she had shared with me some of those principles. And then maybe about a month later, um, and I knew we were moving back to St. Louis because of my husband's job. And I was really scared about how was I going to develop a client base after having been gone from St. Louis for so long? Because I guess I was, in North Carolina for 13 years because we moved from South to North. And I had a I had a steady client base. I didn't have to do, I mean, I just I just had worked hard to develop the next works and I didn't have to do much. So I thought, ooh, if I move back here, there's a lot, there's a lot more therapists, this is a bigger town. How am I going to do this? I was worried. And I was thinking of emotional intelligence and a catalog came in the mail. And I just happened to open it. And there was this whole thing about the EQI 2.0, which is an emotional intelligence model, and it's an assessment tool. And reading the literature about it, this is a catalog from MHS Incorporated, who owns the model that I use, that I ended up getting certified in. It really spoke to me. And I thought, I think that's my way in because and they were a coaching, they are coaching and consulting people and it was obviously used in business because there was also somebody else in there that was a coach so he was doing what I wanted to do and I ended up contacting him and he coached me for two years on this model so that's a long long way in but I'm hoping that some of what I'm saying is going to be useful for what we're doing today yeah. and I think something that you talked a lot about when you were kind of going back and forth about what you wanted to speak on and points that you wanted to make with self-regard um, talk a little bit about self-regard and are you born with that? Is that something that you develop? 
Great question, Cindy. <laughs> so this model, the EQI 2.0, the, the answer is anybody at any age at any time can develop self-regard or any of the other 16 EQ skills. So I became fascinated by this model and I grew up in a family that was somewhat dysfunctional because now that I know what I know that I didn't know at the time I was a little girl, my mother most likely had a mental health diagnosis for which it, she was not getting treated. And it affected the family. It affected me. I was the oldest of three. And she was very, very critical. And I was a very serious child. So I took everything people say at face value. And I, I times it, time, you know, took what they did and times it by 100. But regularly, my mom would say things like, uh, you don't know what you're talking about. You're, you're a dumb bunny things like that. And it went into my unconscious and I ended up believing it. That was another reason why I had to get all these degrees that I have because I kept thinking I was stupid. And well, if I just have another degree, but you know, that wasn't really the issue. I know, I know that now. So I, when I took this, I had already taken things like Myers-Briggs or DISC, and those are personality trait like indicators that you're born with. And the research for them said, said they might fluctuate in a range, but the range is narrow and st your core tends to st stay static over time. Not so with this EQI 2.0. These are skills. And uh, when I took it, I had this little hubris because I thought, wow, I've been, a, I've been in psychology for a long time. I've, I've been in therapy for a long time. I should score at the high end for all 16 skills. But I didn't. It kind of came back average, not real high, not real low. And I started crying when I was taking the class <laughs> because that was something that when I wasn't didn't have self regard as much, I would end up crying at work. Which you know, it, back in those days, that was terrible. <laughs> and and I had a client yesterday who told me this is funny because I didn't think this till just now. I had a client yesterday who's um, she's in education. And she was telling me that she cried in front of her boss. And, and the boss said, stop, stop crying. And I, I said, is your boss a man? She said, no, my boss is a woman. But she couldn't handle my tears. And that's what happens. People get embarrassed, right? So what I found out after I stopped crying was that these skills could be learned. And I needed to raise my self-regard. And in this model, self-regard means this means, okay, I know I'm really good at these things over here, and I know I'm not so great at these things over here. However, I can integrate all that, and I can still love and accept myself the way I am. And back in those days, I couldn't. I, I was, uh, I can be a perfectionist. I can be self-critical. I had internalized my mother's voice. So if I've learned anything, over the years, it's if you want to be successful in your career or as a business owner or as a mother, as a spouse, you must love yourself and you have to work on loving and accepting and forgiving yourself. And when you do that, you're going to be better. Like self regard is the foundational skill. You'll be better at all the other 15 skills if you're able to be good at self-regard. And if you're not, if you're lower in that, you're gonna have more trouble doing the skill building to learn the other skills. So realizing that you have strengths and weaknesses and how to kind of play on both of those and use them interactively. Yes, because if we notice we have, a, it's so we, it, this can still happen to me on a bad day, but back then, if somebody said, um, oh, I'll give you an example. Um, when I used to get my evaluations in public accounting, and I was told this by more than one firm, mm -hmm. they would say, Roberta, you need, to, you need to look more serious. You can't go around smiling all the time. And you can't be talking all the time to people. <laughs> we <laughs> want to yeah, yeah. Never survive. <laughs> Never. Put your head down, do your tax returns, you know, oh, wow. and, and look serious. That used to take my spirit down. And what I would do was say, oh, Roberta, you're no good. Oh my God, I would, I would turn it inward on me with this negative self-talk. By the way, we all have ne negative self-talk. Anybody who has a human brain is gonna have negative self-talk. 
But what I didn't know back then, which I know now, is we can turn that negative self-talk around. You can talk back to that. That's coming from the amygdala, which is right back in the brainstem. And it's an important piece of self-regard because the amygdala used to be the only part of the brain we had. Now our brains have evolved over many, many, many years. And we have something called the cortex up here and a prefrontal cortex here. And the prefrontal cortex is where emotional intelligence lies. The cortex is where you do logical things like processing. But the amygdala, that's your fight or flight. That sole purpose back in the cave people days was to keep us literally alive and to continue the species on the planet. So when a wild tiger would run at somebody, it would pump adrenaline and cortisol into your body so you could run with superhuman <laughs> strength. The problem today, it doesn't know the difference between an honest to goodness physical threat or something that's psychological, like a deadline. Like you have a deadline tomorrow and you haven't gotten it finished. Your amygdala will trigger you. It goes from zero to a thousand in a split second and it always imagines the worst case scenario. So you have to learn to talk back to it. Man. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you have to learn to talk back to it because guess what? It's not it's not gonna calm down on its own. <laughs> you can change that. You know, they used to think the brain was static. We used to think IQ was the IQ you're born with. But there are people like Jim Quick is one of them who wrote a book named Limitless that explained what neuroplasticity and what they know now in neuro, neurobiology. You can change your brain. You can change your IQ. You can change your cortex. I've changed my amygdala. You can shrink it. <laughs> you can absolutely shrink it. Wow, that's incredible. Um, since we are female focused space, you kind of talked a little bit about self regard, but what does it mean for women? How how is important is self-regard for women, especially in the workplace and, and being confident in yourself? Like you said, your, your client was crying to her boss and she was showing vulnerability and her boss didn't respond all that well. That probably really hurt her confidence. How can you be yourself and be vulnerable, but also kind of realize that self-regard and what's, what's appropriate? It's another great question. So I'm going to answer it by adding in two more skills because I think it will help paint the picture for you better. One thing about this model is that they, you are going to be more effective if you have all the skills in balance or as many of the skills in balance. So while, while the way they factored the questions in this assessment tool is gender neutral, here's what I noticed with my subset of clients. I noticed that Men score higher in assertiveness and lower in empathy. Women score higher in empathy and lower in assertiveness. And, and let me tell you the definition, and it has to do with self-regard, because if your self-regard is lower, those your assertiveness score is going to be lower. But assertiveness in this model does not mean aggressive. So sometimes when I notice, when, when my male clients take this assessment, some will say, what do you mean, Roberta, that I'm scoring medium or low in assertiveness. I know I'm assertive. I, I speak my mind all the time and I do all these deals. And I say, okay, do you do this in a non-offensive way? And then they say, well, no, <laughs> no. And that's what this is about. This is assertiveness is taking initiative. It's taking, it's this sweet spot between being passive on one end and aggressive on the other. So if you're passive and you're negotiating a deal, you'll say to yourself that, and this is where I think women tend to do this. Uh, I want you to get what you want more than I want to get what I want. Because we're kind of socialized that way. And aggressive means, I don't care if you get what you want. I want to get what I want. That's what more men tend to do. And assertiveness that's healthy is, I want you to get as much as you want and me to get as much as I want as possible, but we're both getting our needs met. Mm -hmm. And that's real assertiveness. And so, and then empathy is, uh, am I able, because that boss from my client, uh, I think she was kind of act, acting out of maybe a met more of a masculine perspective, which isn't bad. We need both a masculine and a feminine perspective. But if she had better empathy, she would have said, she would have been able to put herself in, in, her client, in my client's shoes, see things from her point of view, Maybe she didn't agree that she was crying, but she could have said, 
the way I know you, I can understand why that would make you upset. I mean, I said that to a, to a different client yesterday and she burst into tears, but it was, a, it was very appropriate because she'd been holding back on how hard it was to raise a son who's now eight years old, who has developmental, um, some developmental, I guess you'd say disabilities or challenges. And, and nobody, she felt like her husband had not acknowledged her for that. I feel like it gets super confusing for women also because on one hand the trend is be vulnerable yes. be authentic and then yes. on the other hand is you know be assertive be more right. not man-like but you know <laughs> don't show that piece and so I think that's weird. maybe you just want to cry because of that you know <laughs> maybe to, to help with the confusion yeah. think of keeping it all in balance keep of keep of keep think of keeping it um a little of each. I'm a big believer in a both and instead of an either or. Mm -hmm. So so I tell people I use the word and all the time. You use the word what? <laughs> and that's her calls okay. me out. I'm like, and and <laughs> you want to be, I was telling a different person, you want to be warm and firm. So part of the research that Dr. Steven Stein did, who owns this model, he's uh, he started an entrepreneur who started MHS Incorporated. They did, a, they researched who, what do the most profitable CEOs have in common? And I don't know how he chose the CEOs, but I remember <laughs> it by, think of Ace Hardware, Ace, or Ace to Ace something. A is for assertiveness. C, I changed self-regard to confidence just to have an acronym. And E is empathy. So if you're, if you're like warm and firm and you feel good about yourself, you're going to make more money. You're going to be more profitable and you're going to be able to better motivate other people like sure. your direct reports. Sure. Yeah. I think too, if you're coming from someone higher up, like you said, and you don't feel confident about yourself, you're going to be projecting all of your worries and insecurities on your employees, whether you have a ton or a couple. And then those people are going to feel that pressure and not want to do things for you, or maybe they don't then feel confident in themselves. Similar to your dad saying certain things to you, mm -hmm. you didn't feel that confidence in yourself then growing up. Correct. Yeah. I, I really didn't feel confident in myself yeah. growing up. That's true. Yeah. So talk a little bit about, you said when men take the analysis, they're really high in assertiveness and low in empathy and women are opposite. How can you balance that? How can you increase your self-regard? Should I talk about the index card exercise? Yes, and that's is that the right time? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's never a wrong time. Never a wrong time. <laughs> and maybe <laughs> preliminary to the index card exercise, yeah. it, one of the things that helped me the very most, and I don't even think I came up with it myself, I read it somewhere, but if you sit and make a list of all the accomplishments, you think it doesn't have to just be career related, because another piece of this is you want to feel confident in your personal life as well as your business life. You know, part of my struggle when I was younger and choosing, I, I tended to choose men who didn't treat me well. That's kind of what I expected. Um, when I changed that, then everything, my expectations, then every, everything changed. So if you, when I became more balanced in my personal life and happier at home, because I met and married the right guy, then I also noticed I did much better in my business life and in my career because one informs the other. So that's balance too. Okay, so the question was, if you were to start making a list of your most proudest accomplishments, and it could be that you're a mother, it could be that you're an excellent sister, it could be that you're an excellent um, partner for someone, but you get as specific as you can and you write down as many as you can. That's like step number one. And then this index card exercise, again, it's not mine. I didn't come up with it. Um, I learned it in my leadership coaching specialist training. <clears throat> and let me just set it up this way. That one of my clients who, is, who, who has been a CEO of different <clears throat> companies <clears throat> used this exercise when they had to pitch, they were looking for um, venture capital money and they had to pitch, I think 70 different <coughs> pitches to 70 different companies. And they were hearing a lot of no's. Mm -hmm. 
And this person told me that doing this exercise is what kept them afloat, is, is how they could pick that, and it was a woman, pick herself up, dust herself off, and go back out there again. Because, you know, in the venture capital world, it's changing, it's mostly men, mostly men. So what I had her do, what we started out with, and I, I do this exercise myself, you want to take that list of accomplishments and then try to break it out into short pieces. They could be qualities that you know you're good at or that you love about yourself, or they could be accomplishments. And you write one per index card because you want to be able to flip through them. And I'm going to, I'll demonstrate in a moment, but you're, you're going to take this. This is the hard part. <laughs> it's awkward at first. You're going to stand in front of a mirror and you're going to smile at yourself. <laughs> and some people say to get into the feeling, you might need to do this or <laughs> make it big, do a victory dance, but you're going to start reading these. I am warm and caring. I am attentive. I am experienced. I am relatable. These are mine. I'm not saying that these have to be yours. I'm approachable. I am successful. I know more than the client does about this topic. You just don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an expert. Uh, let's see. I'm intuitive. I understand human nature. I am gutsy. I'm a risk taker. And, you know, the list goes on. And, and I think I started out by saying, because when I started this exercise, I was at a low point because of something that happened in my family when my mother died. It was very difficult to pick myself up and dust myself off. Uh, I, I had to do a lot of work and I could only say on my first card, I was trained by talented people. I was trained by the best because I couldn't say that yet about myself in the, in the uh, emotional intelligence model and things like that. So you can back into it if you're really low in the hole, mm -hmm. but you want to get as many of these cards as you can. And the, the magic about reading it out loud as you look at yourself in the mirror is you're, you're bringing conscious awareness to it, but you're also going to burn this into your unconscious. I'm sure you know about our unconscious minds. They're the repository for anything and everything that was ever said. So if I started out by saying I am talented and I didn't believe it, my unconscious might herb up. Uh, no, you're not. Your mother said you weren't. And that should be, it was at one time, a stronger belief for me than what I thought about myself. But you do this, actually, if you were to do this like 30 days in a row, you would notice or you could, the possibility is to notice a big change. The most miraculous change I saw was in, in was a man who was in the, um, he was in Grenada in the pandemic in the hospitality industry and no one was able to come to Grenada. He was in HR and he was responsible for keeping people's spirits up. And when we first started, his body language on Zoom was kind of like this. And he joined Toastmasters and he did this exercise and he did it quickly. He, we had hardly, I think we only had five meetings. And by the time we finished, he was, his personality was big <laughs> and he filled the room and he was smiling and there was huge change. Yeah. So this is, it sounds simple. So I know when I first heard it, I disregarded it because I was like, oh, that sounds too simple. How could that work? But if you take this to heart and you do this, I promise you it's going to build your self regard. So do you keep adding cards to that then? Yes, so I keep like, adding. Because every now and then, you know, you don't think of those things, but you hear somebody else say it to yeah. you after all, and you're like, I can see adding that. It makes me then reflect on it because mm -hmm. I think the visual of seeing a stack of cards of great things that yeah. a person yes. is, because I can only ever think of the two things that are terrible right. about me all the time. Whereas if you had a full stack of things that were like, might help. Yes. Might so the person that I said was the CEO seeking venture funding started out with maybe five cards, then 10, mm. then 15, and then 20. And I think she's up to 30 now or something like that. And is it more important to put down what you believe about you? Or is it to also find out like, well, what do other people believe about me? And then mm -hmm. therefore I internalize. That, you know how we are often most critical of ourselves. Yes, our that's history. another like thing to add. You can add to the exercise. Absolutely. 
Because other people are yeah. mirrors. Yeah. Other people are mirrors for us, right? Yeah, right? Right. We don't. We have blinders on mm -hmm. because of how we've been raised or trained in school yeah. or our life experiences. Or you feel like you're still working on that piece, but other people, you know, and it, it's it's like anything when you compare somebody. Somebody is always more this, that, or that when you don't realize how. You, know, you want to get to the point where you're again you're able to say okay so and so is better at that than i am but i'm okay about that mm -hmm. i'm okay because i know i i know what my lane is mm -hmm. i know where my gifts are mm -hmm. and so if you if you have the mindset that every person on the planet has gifts and talents we don't i'm glad you brought that up because i was going to bring that up today yeah. about how sometimes it's easy to, if you're human, to get jealous. I get jealous too. But then I try to remind myself, they have their gifts and talents, I have mine. We could have the similar gifts and talents, but you're gonna say this, if, like if you taught people this exercise, you'd say it in a different way than I'm teaching it. Mm -hmm. And there's gonna be some people that are gonna be attracted to how you say it, and other people will be attracted to how I say it. And we're each gonna have our right people, the people we're supposed to work with, the people we're supposed to have. And if, if you think about, oh, that person has more of this or that than I do, oh, then they're an example that it's possible. And I can choose to develop that, whatever it is, if I wish to, because everything is learnable. I feel like this is something we should be doing with our children. Where right? yeah. and we yes. start the children off, you know, and I have this issue with one of my sons, you know, because mm -hmm. in the boy world, it's very much about like what sport do you play yeah. and are you good at this? And I do have one child who's not an athlete, but he's amazing at art and music and empathy. And I keep trying to tell him because this is not what society tells you as a young boy either. Like they have their own things. That no, they they're told to that they're with. playing sports and they skin their knee and they're crying. Tough it up, up. real men right. don't cry. Right. Hold your emotions in, go on. And I tell them all the time, I'm like, but how boring would it be if there was never any art or music in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have to have a variety of strengths, but I do think our population, our society tells us like, this is how you should be as a female, mm -hmm. and this is how you should be as a male, and you should all be good at these things, and you should all be good at this. And now with social media, we should all be good at everything, right. including right. posting. Which gets very right. overwhelming. Right. 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 So this is a really good exercise, mm -hmm. I think, for women, for children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have Haley bringing in some index cards, so we'll get started. I would think it would be a lot easier. <laughs> Retrain than a fifty year old brain. Amen, sister. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Start with the ten year old. Yeah. Right. I even remember going through college and everyone would always ask you, "What are you going to do? What are you going to be?" Know. And I'm like, "I don't know. I have no idea. I know what I like, but it, it's not necessarily what other people are kind of telling me I should like." So I definitely mm -hmm. had an internal battle. I'm sure everyone's kind of mm -hmm. experienced that at some point, whether it's college or later in life kind of figuring out, okay, well, I know I'm good at these things, but can I use those things to, to be successful? Yes, yeah. Can I make money off of those things? <laughs> she is no longer a CPA. Right. I'm no longer a teacher. True. I was yeah. no longer the finance person. <laughs> yeah. So I was yeah. Old, I sure well, and I yes. think that I've seen research, and this was maybe five years ago, so the number could have changed, mm -hmm. but that people coming five years ago, they were saying, People coming out of undergrad will be changing careers on average seven to eight times. Um, I believe it. It's more fluid now. The, the career, you know, in the in our parents' generation, yeah, our grandparents' generation, so. people did not change careers. Yeah. No, I actually look at it like, okay, here's who I am now at age 50, which is different than 40, but I still have like three more careers. I need two before I die. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. Then I would work backwards. <laughs> if you're very serious about that, I would write it down and then I work backwards. If I want to do those careers, what are the steps I would have to take to qualify myself to do that? And then you could even, do you see how you could get a timeline? Sure. You know, which decade am I going to do this? Which decade <laughs> am I going to do that? Yeah, I just need the clock to slow down. Yeah. And we all need that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have some index cards for you and those of you are on Zoom. Let's take a couple minutes to do three to five. No pressure if you can't come up with three or even five, but take a few minutes. Um, 
you know if your plan was to have them read it off or to keep them to themselves but my plan through. was very loose okay. and i was going to ask people if they want to do that and they should have yeah. you partner and read them to each other yeah. if you don't wish to do mm -hmm. that you can just keep it private sure. because i don't like to push people past where they are that's sure. right okay take a few minutes those of you on zoom go ahead and either keep it to yourself or put it in the chat and then we can kind of reconvene in a few minutes let's go ahead and continue all right cool okay so we talked a little bit while you guys were doing that about kind of having a morning routine and what that looks like for self-regard can you speak on that a little bit so mine has taken you know it's taken commitment and it's taken some years to develop this but now it's my sacred time so i mean i'm i do, i'll confess i don't have children and i think that makes my ability to have a morning routine as a woman, different from those of you in the room who have small children, yours is gonna to have to be different, but maybe, maybe everybody can wake up earlier. So I wake up early and um, after I get my coffee, first thing in the morning, I will either read, and I like to read physical books, not on screens. So I will read something that's feeding my brain. It, it's usually about emotional intelligence or, you know, kind of like um, self-development type topics. And I'll do that for maybe 15 or 20 minutes. And then I spend another 15 minutes meditating. And sometimes I meditate with like, like no, no, it's not an assisted meditation where somebody's walking me through a meditation. It's just me on my own. And then at other times I will use one that somebody has created because I'm uh, like right now I'm working on abundance and manifestation. And so I'm using things that are created by someone named Carrie Noah, because I'm in her abundance group. So uh, those, those involve creative visualization, let's say. And I forgot to say, I, I think journal writing is very important. So you could take your index cards and because these, these are like affirmations. If you say, I am talented, that's, that's an affirmation. Uh, I have one that says, I'm poised for greatness. I have confident expectations about growing my business because I, I will, on a bad day, have a fear that I can't. Mm -hmm. So if you write those down with your hand, you, that's when you could, might hear that negative self-talk come up. And then you want to reframe whatever comes up. You could, and, and a great phrase is even though, even though I'm afraid my business is going to tank during the pandemic, I am confident that I'm confident that I know what I'm talking about. Even though I lost a client last week, I am confident that I'll find a new one or a new one will find me or I'm open. So it's all about taking the negative self-talk and reframing it. That's a way you can use your journal. Another way you can use your journal is to say, okay, here's what I'm struggling with today. And then you can write any negative thoughts that come up. And then you could try to re, you know, turn those around into positives as best you can. So I'm a firm believer in using that journal, using meditation, you know, reading something that's, or, or could be a podcast, but for me, I like to read, reading something that's very inspirational. And then after that, I, I usually exercise, you know, people exercise at different times of the day, but I feel, I, I have to fill me up that way before I sit down with a client. I really, I, I, I have some clients who say, they have different jobs than me, but they start, they roll, like during the pandemic, they didn't shower, they didn't uh, get dressed, they were in their pajamas or whatever, because nobody could see them. And they would just jump right, you know, like 10 minutes before work started, they got up. So for me, I did not change my schedule during the pandemic. I still got dressed up. Now, I, I'll admit I tended to wear tops and skirts instead of dresses so sure. much. But I put my makeup on, I took my shower because for me, it was really important to keep the structure so I could feel like things were, like I was still in my routine. That I knew about because there was research after 
um, that that if you could help like your kids stick to a normal routine when people were scared after 9-11, they did better. So, so having a routine and a structure that you follow will not only help children feel better, but guess what? It helps you feel better too. I think there's something to say too. I have a couple of friends who go on vacation and work out on vacation. I'm like, I'm on vacation. I don't want to work out. But there is something to say about having some kind of normal routine, even when you're taking a break from your normal life. Yes. Kind of fitting in those normal things just to make the transition back into after your vacation a little better. I always say, I need a vacation from my vacation and I shouldn't need that. <laughs> if I'm doing it right, I should be able to transition both ways even. That's a great point because think of the in, in Jungian psychotherapy, there's a there's a tenant called the tension of the opposites. Mm -hmm. So just think of a pendulum, two opposites in a wide swing. So think of let's say if you're all buttoned up about your workouts when you're in your regular work day, you're over here at an extreme, maybe. And then you go on vacation if you switch to the opposite and do absolutely nothing. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. For some people, that might be what they need. But then it's going to be harder to swing all the way back. So I do what you're talking about. I work out on vacation. Mm -hmm. And I try to stay in the middle. So I'm not having big, wide swings right. from extreme to extreme. Right. Another thing we talked about while you guys were writing down um, your index cards was, what if you're on the extreme? of assertiveness or extreme of self-regard. You have a lot of confidence in yourself, but how do you keep yourself humble? And how do you empathize with other people who might not be as confident in themselves and have that self-regard? That, and that's where the balancing act of this tool comes in. Um, sometimes people who are very, very high on the self-regard tend to be low on empathy or low on in interpersonal relationships is another and social responsibility. That those are some of the other skills that would help keep a person humble. So putting yourself in someone else's shoes, seeing things from their point of view. You don't have to agree with them, but if you know that a person, let's say a person that reports to you has a different history than you do, you know, maybe they're at a different, they could be at a different income level, they could have different resources. Um, keeping in mind that they are they are in a different spot than you but you can't judge them for that and they may have something different that they need from you as the boss um, that will help keep you humble if if a person there's a, there's a eq skill in this model called self-actualization that's a skill of always wanting to learn more always believing there's something more to learn always wanting to be at the top of your game so if there's something, if you're high in that, if there's always something to learn, you couldn't possibly say, I know it all, right? Because that's, that could border on egotistical, you know, egotism. Mm -hmm. And high self-regard is not somebody being egotistical. I feel like we're in a weird world too, because I feel like sometimes when you come across as, as not arrogant, but, you know, confident in what you do, there's a whole world of people who are not there yet or not aware of it. So then you do come across as you're all that in a bag of chips kind of thing. Yes. And then you get to other people that are much, you know, so then you're on both sides. Like yeah. one time it's too much, one time it's not enough. You brought up an excellent point. I forgot to say oh, this. Thanks. I'm writing that down. I bring up excellent points. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. Good. <laughs> Part of the definition of emotional intelligence is it's, it's up to me to read my audience. It's up to me to meet, to be able to have the flexibility to adjust and meet the person I'm talking to where they are without expecting them to meet me where I am. And that's a bit, that would, if a person is high in that and has that in mind, they're going to dial it down. If they're in front of somebody that doesn't have it so dialed up, they can dial it up, they can dial it down. They're, they'll be very emotionally flexible like that. So again, not expecting <laughs> people to meet me where I am, but me expecting me to meet others where they are. We have a few more minutes. Does anyone else have any other questions for Roberta? Can you score high on all 16? Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> so let me explain. So uh, thank you for asking that because I love talking about this. This model was created by Dr. Ruben Baran, and then afterwards, Dr. Steven Stein joined in, and they they he took it even farther. And this model, this assessment, has been translated into thirty three different languages, and and has been administered in one hundred and fifty four different countries. So it's extreme. I chose this one because it's very statistically reliable and very scientifically valid. So there, when you it's a you answer these questions, it's self-report. There's 133 questions, takes you 10 minutes, you do it online. Then that your scores, when I score it, you'll be compared to 4,000, how 4,000 other people answered those questions. And there's different categories of people. I usually choose people like, how do you compare against other professionals? But there's a category with, you know, non-professionals too, or anybody. You could have a different number because it gives you a numerical score. And you could be uh, compared to your age group in, in decades. But I usually do every age because most people I work with are working with other people of all ages in a professional setting. And then it just gives you the number, you get a number, low, medium, or high, vis-a-vis -vis how other people answered it. And that's, that can be shocking. It was shocking when I saw my first result. Um, but it gives you, I think that's the value of this is you see like if you're not as high as you could be and you see other people are higher, you're like, oh, I need to do some work. And the promising thing is any, anybody at any age can build these skills. My understanding is that uh, Dr. Baran and Stein even took the skill build, because I do skill building exercises for all of these. They took it into inpatient psychiatric units and even people with heavy duty diagnoses of schizophrenia were able to build their skills. Wow. That to me is really impressive. That means anybody can do this. So we need to take a baseline test now and then. That's exactly <laughs> what I did. They, they uh, usually tell you, or according to the statistics, you can't retest for six months. It won't be so accurate. You have to wait at least six months. My mentor that coached me said he never retests anybody, but I do. And I have retested myself after I coached two years of him and my scores radically jumped. But on a given day, if I'm, if I'm low in the hole for some reason, I might not use one of those skills. So you can still fall short if you're not, you know, if you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or sick, which is halts. Hungry, mm -hmm. angry, lonely, tired, or sick. You might not use one of those skills. So it's not like you're you just, nobody's going to be perfect, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's a good point because we forget you're going to be perfect every day. Yeah. There are days, I'm going to borrow your phrase, low in the hole. That's like you said it two or three times. Like, <laughs> feeling low in the hole today, friends. <laughs> yeah. Like, that just happens. Mm -hmm. right. That's life. And, and, it, and if you have good self regard, you'll accept it. And you'll say, and you'll have the emotional self-awareness to say, ooh, today's the day I'm low in the hole. I need to be more mindful. I need to just slow down. But you're not going to sit there. No, yeah. no, but I like her phrase better. I, mean, yeah. I had this just like last week. I <laughs> yeah. said to them, I was like, I'm in a funk. Mm -hmm. But funk is not as good sounding as right. low in the hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I am low in the hole today, right? It's like more fun. Says Roberta. <laughs> you can also say below par. I mean, I have the low par. Yeah, yeah. Low 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 low. Low. yeah. <laughs> and I forgot to say the whole reason that this research was done, because I think this is important and this model was created, they were looking for the answers to two questions. What makes people successful and what makes people happy? happy, both at work and at home. Yeah. So in this model, if you're not happy at whatever you're doing at work, and even if you're successful at it, mm -hmm. and you're not happy, you're not kind of considered as successful mm -hmm. as you could. Yeah. So happiness and well-being is skill number 16. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of overarching over yeah. all the other skills. Can it be cheated? 
Oh, well, that's an excellent question. Yeah. <laughs> so no, I'm trying to watch out for these people that are like, oh, well, I'm actually so emotionally intelligent. Oh. It's like, no, you're not. You just know how to lie. So, <laughs> so I have had the unhappy experience of having to tell somebody that. Oh. Mm -hmm. So one of the there's there are, there are checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So in my coach's report, it will tell me is somebody is is there a high probability that somebody was overly positive about themselves or even overly negative. I've never seen anyone come out overly negative, but I have had a couple of clients come out overly positive. One of them was a male and I had to tell them that and they got mad at me. So I said, would you do me a big favor and show this report to your wife? And would you ask your wife if she thinks you've scored accurately? That person came back and said, "My wife, my wife said, um, no, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really not as <laughs> as empathetic as this report says I am, as I rated myself to be." But then they dropped out after that, and I think it was because it was hard <laughs> yeah. for them to accept. Right? Yeah. So yeah. sure, I it think I think any assessment tool can only be um, at best. I mean, this is just me, eighty five percent accurate, but. MHS says that theirs is, I think it's 97% accurate on the first time you take it and 93.7 maybe on the second time mm -hmm. you take it. But sometimes people misunderstand the questions and I find out, oh, they thought it said this, but it really said that. And that can sometimes be a reason for the score. It's like when you take those strength finders on and they keep asking you a similar question just differently yeah. to drill it down. Mm -hmm. and no. Right. <laughs> I already answered. I could be this or this. So I right. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Roberta. Feel free to